my name is Kendra. Um, I work with Shell Gear. I'm the managing director there. And we are a fully crypto, Bitcoin in, Bitcoin out, um, sportsbook, and casino. So this gave away my first joke, but um, this meme is, should I sell my Bitcoin? And the answer is no, or no, but in red. Um, the answer is no. Um, for my friends over there who know something about crypto, love it. Um, I would like to provide some context today about the crypto community. So where we were kind of 10 years ago um, when I started working with companies like mine um, and where we are now and what we're excited about moving forward. Yeah, so no, no but in red. So um, I'd like to start by talking about who would be an early adopter of a decentralized peer-to-peer trustless form of currency. And when we talk about trustless, it means we don't need to rely on a centralized figure. Um, and we talk about not relying on a centralized figure that includes banks. So we don't love the banking <laughs> stable coins, but we're excited to see what they do with them. Um, so the, the answer is the mathematicians, the programmers, very excited about what um, opportunities um, are opened up by this kind of mathematical solution to real world problems. And so when I'm talking about early adopters of this, I'm not talking about now, because I feel like when I have conversations with folks on the island, you guys are um, feeling like you're, you're starting to regulate this, you're starting to explore this. But these folks um, were starting to explore this really in the 80s, but um, from a practical perspective in 2009, 2010. So we're talking about mathematicians and programmers. We're talking about venture capitalists who want to invest in what they're building. Um, the risk-taking finance folks who see an opportunity to make money. Um, our friends who made some money in crypto early. Um, I'm gonna be honest, criminals, because when I'm in this room and I say crypto, I think a lot of you think about Silk Road. Um, and then just non-criminals who don't trust their government or central banking, which here we're really lucky that we live in a democratic society and we can talk to our government. A lot of folks here in this room, we have easy access to them. It's not the case in a lot of countries. And I think where we're seeing, where I'm personally seeing the most uptake of crypto as an actual form of currency and not just as a distributed ledger system is um, in countries where folks actually don't necessarily their, trust their government or their bank not to keep a cut of their cash. So that's the early folks. I'm not sure um, if this is going to let me move forward. Oh, thanks. Did that work? No. They heard criminals and they cut me off, guys. <laughs> Here we go. Um, okay. So, um, so th honestly, the early days when I started getting into this industry, it was a lot of gaming the system. So it was lots of things happening in gray and black markets, a lot of instant transfers. So now when we're talking about, um, you know, banks or even crypto now takes a little bit longer, but at the time, not too many people were into it. Transfers were taking five or six minutes as opposed to hours or days going through a banking system. And so betters were using this to circumvent limits and use multiple books to get the best odds. And there was really true anonymity. So uh, most of the folks had a license in Curacao, maybe, kinda, but you could set up an account with um, really just any username and a password. Um, so didn't, didn't even wanna know your name. Um, so it really played into something that was exciting for people who were super technically savvy, didn't have a lot of trust in their current political systems. So I would like that context to inform how we're thinking about it moving forward because when you're talking about regulating and bringing in crypto to a traditional tier one jurisdiction, we're talking about how do we win over these people? What's going to get them excited about coming here versus sticking in that gray market that they're already very comfortable in? And I know that you guys are thinking about it because multiple people since I moved here um, have asked me why I'm not in Curacao. So I know we know it's a problem and I'm really excited that we're going to work together to fix it. So I do want to talk about a bit of the perception of you know, who is in this industry right now. Um, all the early folks are still excited about it and I consider 
us later adopters now because all those tech folks built a lot of systems that make it a lot easier to use crypto and a lot easier for us to trace crypto. So it's always been very open, very traceable, but um, now it's a lot easier to do that and it's easier to map the network and see where payments are coming from and where they're going. And a lot we've added, because those systems exist, we've added a lot of people who send money across borders, retail investors, folks like that. So for contacts, like we have a contractor in Canada who does some work for us. We tried to pay her via like bank transfer. It took like a week. It cost us hundreds of dollars. It cost her a hundred dollars. And we thought this is silly. We'll pay you in crypto. It'll take 30 minutes. It will cost $5. Um, so that's a completely above the board KYC compliant transaction. It's a real, real opportunity for us as gaming institutions um, to, or gaming operators rather, and the folks who deliver services to gaming operators to make a player experience better and make an operator experience better. So the question is who's left? And it's mostly the criminals because the folks who ran Silk Road got caught and it's really easy to catch people now um, because crypto is anonymous but it's traceable. So I wanna super fast break down what a Bitcoin transaction looks like because I feel like people think, okay, you send me one Bitcoin, someone else sends me one Bitcoin and then I send someone else two Bitcoin and that's really all you know is that I sent them two. But really what you see when you look at one transaction is three different people sent parts of Bitcoin to one person and they packaged all that up and sent two Bitcoin tra transactions out with it. And I can actually follow that transaction trail back in time to the beginning of the blockchain network, hundreds, thousands of steps, and I can follow it forwards in time too, which is really cool because I now know what happens when the Bitcoin leaves my website which I don't think is possible if you're working with Fiat. So I wanted to really quickly show you what um, our compliance tool or one of the tools we use for AML compliance looks like. So I can actually take any Bitcoin transaction that comes into our site and break it down and see what pieces of that, what tiny chunks of those Bitcoin have been exposed to what places and what flags in our risk matrix. So in this particular transaction, I can see that three hops back, so someone sent Bitcoin to someone else who sent it to someone else who sent it to me, three hops back, it was exposed to, a good chunk of it was exposed to a website that clearly is about child abuse. And I can set my parameters to see that at any time in the history, or if it's only greater than 50% of the transaction is exposed, or if it's in within five hops, or whatever those parameters are, I have the ability to see that. And I don't think that exists in fiat, because if I give you a dollar and you put it into your bank account and then put it into a website, they don't know where it came from two hops ago. And it came from me and I'm the scary crypto lady. So it definitely came from somewhere super sketchy. Um, so this is a really, really interesting thing. And I, this is my open invitation to the folks in this room because it's hard for us to do business on the island because of the great focus on compliance and AML. And we like it here because of that. It's important to us that we're building something that is very transparent, is very open with the players, with the government, with everybody involved because that's what we believe is missing in the Bitcoin space right now because um, it's a little shady. I've been working in it for a while. I can admit that. Um, but we want to do this correctly. So I would invite any of you, if you want to explore um, your own risk appetite for working with crypto companies, please come talk to me because I would be happy to show you our risk matrix and how we do our AML and compliance policies because I think it's a really cool opportunity for, for everyone on the island, not just for folks like us. So super quickly, I wanted to spend more time here, but then I heard all the concerns this morning and I thought I'd spend more time talking about compliance. Um, I am really excited because we are going to um, kind of one of two places. So either deep player knowledge, both on and off site, because we can see that Bitcoin movement, we know a lot or could theoretically know a lot about our players. So if they withdraw it to their exchange and then they take it to somewhere else, what else is that place, right? What else are they interested in? What other exchanges or 
crypto sites or movie theaters are they going to, all of that. Or we could go to a place that's Web3, completely decentralized, no control, no oversight, very, very trustless. Um, so it's a really cool opportunity um, for both potential paths. And I think you'll see crypto operators kind of split there or do both. Um, we're going to a place where things are provably fair. So I will tell you that those crypto community people, they do not care that you have validated the casino game. They don't care about your testing certificates. They don't trust it because it's a government and you could be bribed, you could be corrupt. They don't care, it's human fallibility. The math, however, that they trust. So there are lots of ways because things are built on blockchain to be able to validate the actual spin or the card deal or whatever um, of the game. So provably fair means very crypto specific games, it means dice, it means crash, it means lots of really cool stuff. Um, we're going to the players being able to participate in the success of the site because just like their wallets are traceable, my wallet is also traceable. So there's a guy on YouTube right now who is literally dedicating all of his time to proving that um, a bunch of very high profile influencers in the States are basically scamming their followers by telling them that they're gambling these huge amounts at this crypto website. But they're looking at the wallets and being like, you did not put one cent into this wallet. We can see. So what are you gambling with? Why are you lying to your followers? So very, very transparent, which I think is really, really cool. And then um, NFTs. So I'm not gonna touch too much on this because I think that's coming after me. So I'm very excited to hear about that. But um, I'm excited about the things that like DraftKings are doing with Autograph in terms of uh, auctioning off NFTs of sports memorabilia and things like that. And then Zedrun, which is a pretty cool site where um, basically they're making NFTs of horses and doing a virtual horse racing where you can make money not just on what you're betting on but also the success of the horse that you essentially own so lots and lots and lots of cool stuff so in conclusion what do we do with our bitcoin even though it's volatile and a little bit scary we hodl um, and, and that's it. So I would really please do come chat with me. Um, we are really excited about working with uh, the folks at Champion to explore, um, you know, a lot of new products and how we can build in this market. And uh, with the folks at GBL who are here with me, they have a, a bespoke cryptocurrency payment processing system. Um, so they can also answer uh, questions that are more technical that you have. So yeah, thank you so much.